from South Carolina Public Radio. This is the South Carolina Lead. I'm your host, Gavin Jackson, and this episode was recorded on July 15th, 2024 from Milwaukee, Wisconsin Milwaukee. at the Republican National Convention. On this episode of The Lead, we bring you the latest from the start of the Republican National Convention just days after the assassination attempt on former President Donald Trump's life. I spoke with Lieutenant Governor Pamela Evett and Republican pollster Robert Cahaley about what this all means for the party. But before we get to that, the lead wants to hear from you. So give us a shout at 803-563-7169. That's our voicemail box where you guys can tell us what's on your mind, what you're thinking about, all that good stuff. Obviously, things are really uh, in flux right now as a country, and there's a lot going on. We've been through a lot these days. Uh, It's still very fresh, and a lot of people are still processing things. So uh, give us your thoughts. Talk it through. 803-563-7169. We'll be here for you. Welcome to the first day of the Republican National Convention here in Milwaukee. We're coming to you from the Press Filing Center, about two blocks from the Pfizer Forum, where the entire RNC production is taking place. Of course, we are coming to you just two days after former President Donald Trump narrowly survived an assassin's bullet at a rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. The attempt on Trump's life on Saturday, July 13th, has energized the thousands of supporters in the heart of one of the most important swing states in play this November, including several South Carolinians we've spoken to. As part of our continuing coverage of election 2024, myself, reporter Mayan Schechter. Say hi, Mayan. Hi. And producer Amy Crouch. Hi. We have embedded with the South Carolina delegation this week, where 50 delegates and 47 alternates are in attendance. Now, those delegates and delegates from all 50 states, five territories, and the District of Columbia are formally nominating Trump today here at the first day of the RNC. In fact, it's going on right now. If you hear the background, that's what all that noise is. South Carolinians will also be playing a prominent role in the RNC this week with several politicians set to speak, including Senator Tim Scott today, Monday, July 15th. Former Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley will be speaking on Tuesday, and First District Congresswoman Nancy Mace will be speaking Wednesday evening. SCETV and South Carolina Public Radio are the only news outlets with the delegation all week. We'll be attending daily breakfasts and events with the state's congressional delegation, like I said. That includes the governor, the lieutenant governor, and several statewide elected officials. The only South Carolina politician who is not attending the RNC this week, as far as we can tell, is Third District Congressman Jeff Duncan. 5th District Congressman Ralph Norman, who endorsed his longtime friend and former governor Nikki Haley during that primary process, well, he was originally not set to attend the RNC due to a scheduling conflict. But now he is said to be here. The same goes for Haley, who was originally not invited to the convention even after she released her 97 delegates to vote for Trump. That changed following the events on Saturday. So, like I said, we are embedded with the delegation. We're staying at their hotel, catching up with some of the party activists and leaders that make up the whole crew. We're hanging out in the lobby, watching SCGOP Chairman Drew McKissick shoot pool with Congressman Joe Wilson's grown grandsons. You know, just a little bit of the action happening there at the embassy suites, including Senator Lindsey Graham, who came in after a long day of travel, including flying with President Trump. So we're keeping an eye on things, but also catching up with folks throughout the week, including Lieutenant Governor Pamela Evett, who I spoke with today. I started off by asking her about the attempt on Trump's life. Well, I was in shock when I first saw it happen. You know, something that we all worry about, you know, the the climate and the horrible things that have been said about President Trump and really the target. So, you know, from President Biden, you know, saying that, you know, there should be a target with his face on it, you know. A lot of prominent Democrats, we heard Maxine Waters years ago on tape saying, if you see a Republican, if you see a Trump supporter, make them feel uncomfortable, get in their face. You know, this kind of rhetoric uh, is what we've all been worried about for a long time. And so, and what our families worry about being in elective in elective office. You know, we saw Melania come out yesterday with some very heartfelt words. Uh, something I've been saying for years is that, you know, the role we hold is only a very small sliver of who we are. We're moms and, you know, we're wives and we're daughters and so much more than just what we do every day. And we can definitely say that that's, that 
heated rhetoric definitely splits both ways too. I mean, we've heard yeah. the former president use some choice words too, like vermin and such. Not defending anyone's situation here, but what do, what do you think needs to happen? Do you think we need to lower that temperature on both sides when it comes to how people are treating each other right now? Yeah, I think in society in general, right? You know, like how, how many times I was at a mall a few weeks ago and just, you know, there was just a random shopper screaming and using a profanity, yelling at a worker in a store. You know, you would have not seen that. And, you know, I think it's, you look at our TV shows, you know, you look at reality TV with the foul language and the bad manners and no grace. And it, it's around us everywhere. And I think we're, it's almost starting to be portrayed as this is the norm, right? This is how we should act. Uh, go back and watch a great 80s show. Like turn on, uh, that old, you know, old style TV and look at, you know, Baywatch or Happy Days. And you never saw that. You saw a sense of family. You saw people respecting each other. And so we need to look at that, not just in the political realm, but as, as a nation as a whole, how we treat each other with dignity and respect needs to be top of mind now. And so when you're here, when you're here out here at the Republican convention, we're in Milwaukee, you're talking to folks, you're seeing people, this is a different day and age now than it was on Saturday. Uh, how do you feel like that has changed the entire calculus for the election in November in terms of what do you think it means for the party and for the former president going forward? You know, the president, you know, we're hearing today, I'll be excited to hear from him directly, but we're hearing that he wants to call for unity. And, you know, he wants our party to come together. He wants the nation to come together. And let's start looking at things. These are things that have been important to me, uh, being the lieutenant governor of South Carolina. Like, how do we help people and what affects them every day? How do we make sure that they can pay to gas up their car? And how do we make make sure that they can afford everything on their grocery list. Let's start talking about the things that are really hitting Republicans, independents, Democrats. You know, we're seeing a lot of independents turn to our party because they're feeling that crunch. They're not, you know, things that they didn't feel four years ago. First time in history we've had a clear comparison on, you know, two different administrations. And, and was your life easier in one of them? And if it is, should we be voting that way? I think there's a lot of really... Um, great things to talk about that people want to hear. People want to hear real issues. They want to hear facts. They don't want the name calling and the mud slinging. They want to know how every single one of us in elected office is going to make their life better and make their children safe. Hey, Lieutenant Governor, wrapping up here, I just want to ask you what you're looking forward to maybe the most this week uh, when we come to the big conventions. It's like a big pep rally too, right? Obviously we have some formal business to take care of, but there's so much going on. We got the outfits and all that too. That's right. <laughs> That's right. It's always good, you know, uh, being able, I, I was at an event, I was telling somebody earlier uh, this weekend, and I said, if it has an elephant on or is red, I probably own it. And they said, oh, are you an Alabama fan? And I said, no, I'm a Republican, right? And that's the fun part of this, right? You get together, you see a lot of patriotism, a lot of great patriots here. Um, so it is, it's a big, it is a big pep rally. And I hope that people can see, you know, what we're passionate about and what we care about and that they come into the fold and we bring more people and again, more young people and get people really involved in this process because Gavin, it was dismal. The primary, we had less than 12% uh, turnout in the polls. Uh, we got to do something better. We got to get people excited. We got to make them understand that elections, primaries, these are really important um, things that they have to stay involved in and really get get attached to. Yeah. November's right around the corner. Oh, I know. It seems it's a lifetime, but it's just minutes away, right? <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Pamela Evett, thank you so much for talking with us. It's always great to be with you. Thank you so much. That was South Carolina Lieutenant Governor Pamela Evett. Now, it is obviously still very fresh since it's only just been two days, but Republican pollster Robert Cahaley, who is the CEO of the Trafalgar Group, well, he's looking into what this all means going forward in November. He addressed the delegation at the breakfast, and I asked him about how the assassination attempt changes the campaign. I think it's like everything else. It, it is going to be not permanent, but it's going, to, it's going to affect things in the short term. This is a long election, and a lot of things even things of that caliber may happen. Uh, and, and so y you have to see it in perspective. You know, the night of the debate, my phone rang, oh, the election's over. And the night of this, the election's over. The election's not over till it's over. But I do think it's, it, you're going to see a significant kind of bump in the same way that when he got indicted, people just be kind of, even ones who don't like him, it's just that that's enough. It's kind of a that's enough mentality. And so... But this electorate is pretty evenly divided. And so the polls don't move a huge amount, 
they'll move a little bit, but you know, they're not going to be 10 point swings, e you know, even after the debate. I mean, the thing is, like, after the conviction, they're like, well, how can the majority of people in America believe that, you know, Trump uh, is guilty and still be voting for him? It's like, well, that's what nobody wanted to discuss is that they're still voting for him. And there are people who believe Biden is incompetent who are still voting for him. And so it, you, you move only a small amount of people, but I do think that Trump has built a coalition around, I don't like, you know, people who say, I don't like him that much, but I've had enough. And whether it was the excessive indictments, whether it was, it's just, I've had enough. And I think the I've had enough crowd is really breaking his way. And you could see, uh, you know, a doubling of the lead in the battleground states, I think, would be as high as it would go. But again, we won't be guessing in three days. We'll know. Robert, tell me a little bit more. You're talking, I know you just touched on this, but you said Trump can't just win because Biden's old. He needs to do more than just, I guess, play off that whole age well, factor. Trump can win over Biden's age. But what happens is if the Republicans basically coast on that, they're going to run the risk of not winning the seats they want to win in the House and Senate. Because the difference in polling on many of these races is Trump is that much higher than Biden, but you go to like the Senate race and that's not the case. And so the Republicans need to not get overconfident and to sell their message. And the battleground states right now, the Democrats are doing a very effective job and not just the Democrat party, but the outside groups are doing a good job of constantly educating the public about issues and creating a narrative. And in many states, it is unanswered right now. And you can't expect the Trump campaign nor the RNC to do all this. This is where the generosity of the major donors and the super PAC efforts must engage. And too many people are overconfident. And so overconfidence might very well, Trump may very well win. But if he wins and the Republicans blow an opportunity to get a wide margin in the Senate, and the House, that would be an opportunity wasted. You said something during the breakfast this week about uh, the quickest way to turn around this entire situation post the assassination attempt would to do something crazy on the Republican side. Can you elaborate on what you mean, what, how this kind of uncharted territory that we're in right now, what, how volatile it is for both sides? Well, knowing the way that, knowing the way the media is, if even something as small as Picture one of the things that happened after George Floyd, you know, like one of the police station at Vernon. If a bunch of conservative pro-Trump people did one incident like that, the entire national media narrative would turn on the look at all this violence and politics. And the Republicans need to know, do not feed into that. And, you know, in, in both the Democrats and Republicans in every party is kind of a radical element. And keeping those people under control is very important. It's important for the Democrats to keep them under control, and it's important for the Republicans. I mean, we had Bernie Sanders supporters shoot up a congressional baseball game. We've had a Supreme Court justice have somebody who came very close to getting to his home. Uh, you know, we had what happened to Pelosi's husband. It's on both sides. But uh, I think the narrative could shift quickly, especially when that's a narrative I, I think many in the mainstream media would like to see. I know I don't, but I know what you're saying. Robert, just last question, asking you about just polls. Obviously, you're a pollster. You know them inside and out. Uh, the average person probably sees national polls. They see maybe battleground states polls. Uh, what's your advice to people when they're trying to understand what the polls mean, what to look for, and, and what they should be looking for as we you know, head toward November? Okay, national polls are irrelevant. We all do them, but they're stupid. They don't matter. The Republicans can win the White House being down by two in the national polls. Um, because we don't, elections don't run that way. We do state by state. And really, you probably only have six true battleground states and maybe less than that. Uh, but what happens in those states, especially, I would say, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Nevada are the states that will determine this election. Uh, I think that uh, Pennsylvania and Georgia are trending very high for Trump but the other states are kind of on the bubble. That was Robert Cahaley, who was CEO of the Trafalgar Group. Now, as we tape this, the roll call vote of delegations is underway and Trump is set to be formally nominated and we'll soon find out who his running mate is. Hint, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance. Hmm? Put your money on that one there. 
Of course, we're taping this in the middle of the afternoon here in Milwaukee, and we're going to bring you as much South Carolina-based content as possible. We'll be dropping these podcasts just as quick as we can make them. Trust me, there are a lot of hoops to jump through out here in Milwaukee, but we're doing it to bring you all the coverage that matters to you. So be sure to keep up with me on Twitter at Gavin Jackson and at Myon Schechter, and listen to our newscasts on South Carolina Public Radio, and be sure to check out SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org for our rolling news updates. And guys, I know there's just so much happening this week, and today was definitely probably one of the more busy days for us. We'll have more jibber-jabber in the future. I'm going to have Mayon talking to you. We're going to have some more lighthearted stuff, some more color about what's happening here with the delegation, but uh, just getting our feet wet on the first day here, so be sure to stick with us throughout the week. We'll have a lot of fun stuff, and also be sure to check out the SC Lead Pod Twitter and Instagram accounts. They're back. They're back, baby. The South Carolina Lead is a production of South Carolina Public Radio. Our producer is A.T. Shire. Amy Crouch is our supervising producer. Sean Birch is our executive producer. This podcast is produced with support from PRX and is made possible in part by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, as well as listener contributions to the ETV Endowment of South Carolina. For the South Carolina Lead, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina. Take a picture of me, Amy, please. (laughs) You can put that at the end. Amy, please take a picture of me for the podcast.